We're trying to be objective here, and uh, this is intended to be some interactive session later on. I actually want your feedback. Um, uh, just to check who saw my earlier presentation of those of Vesna. Okay, so you're all fairly familiar with subject. Uh, uh, IPv4 is running out and IPv6 is not. Disclaimer, uh, although uh, the logo from our, our sponsor is up there, I actually am on the payroll from Access Roll. Um, this does not necessarily uh, uh, express the company opinion. Uh, this is more about me. So, um, short agenda. Um, I'll give some background, but I think we can skip on that one uh, because you all know what's happening. Um, introduction on net, I think you're all fairly technical, I hope at least, so we can go over that very soon. Um, well, in the end, there's the open mic, and it would actually, uh, uh, the session is archived, and uh, probably if you give some decent feedback, I will take that feedback, recompile it in a presentation, and for instance, use that in a more provider community like RIPE or the IETF to actually show what you think. So this is your chance on actually giving some comment. Well, the background of this, IPv4 is running out. Somewhere between now, as in today, and April 2012. This is a close estimate. So, uh, 18 months. Well, um, this is a little graph made by Randy Bush earlier. This is what's supposed to have happened. Um, you see the IPv4 pool running out. Uh, IPv6 deployment takes up somewhere when IPv4 will run out. The cost of IPv4 will increase because uh, we can't actually print out new IP addresses, but there are enough and under pressure everything becomes liquid. So to a certain extent, if you pay enough, somebody will sell you his IP address. And find another way of connecting to the internet. Um, well, this is how it's supposed to be. V6 taking over from V4 very uh, gradually and uh, no problem whatsoever. Well, this is today's reality. Um, IPv4 is running out much faster as anybody expected. Uh, while at the same time, IPv6 deployment is a lot less uh, active. There's, there's not that much done, you know. Uh, I've showed you before, I've got 300,000 customers, only 20 of them have IPv6 at the moment. It's not even a small percentage, it's really, really tiny. So uh, what will happen is um, the cost of IPv4 will go up uh, and v6 will stay behind. Um, now there's your problem. Uh, in fact, uh, Jeff Houston, who is actually uh, the, one of the guys actually trying to figure out when we run out, uh, described it as the internet is going to hit a brick wall with the growth engines at full speed. This is our future. This is within 18 months, the internet, we will hit the wall. Now all of a sudden there are no IP addresses left, the internet stops growing. So what's the big problem? Extendi extending the life of IPv4. Uh, it's about short-term reasoning for it. Um, there's no serious IPv6 deployment. The internet keeps on growing. But also for the long term, uh, it's not expected for V4 to disappear within a reasonable time frame. Expectations are 40, 50 years, you still have IPv4 services running around in the internet. And some way, some form, you will need to talk to those services, whether you have IPv6 or not you need to talk to those IPv4 services for 40 years. So how are we going to do that? Well, here we go. Network address translation. Uh, hands if you know what it is, or hands if you don't know what it is. <laughs> well, all okay, right, so you're aware every DSL modem at home, everybody uses it. It's, uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, you just translate and you, you basically keep track of who's sending what by port number and putting the traffic back. Now, let's assume I have 200,000 customers connected to my network, and let's assume I can only afford 100,000 IP addresses. I say, let's assume I can afford, because in the end, IP addresses will be there, just you have to pay for it. So, um, well, I do the same thing in my provider network. I basically buy a big router, put it in front of it, give all my customers an RFC 1918 address, and on the outside, I have one address, and I actually have two customers sharing a single IP address. So you will be sharing the same IP address as your neighbor. Um, this poses some very easy problems already. Um, 
What about duplicate RFC 1918 addresses? Because if I'm going to use 10 slash 8 in my network, obviously it's pretty hard if the customer is also using 10 slash 8. That can get messy. So actually I'm going to tell the customer to not use 10 slash 8 and because I want to do it. And uh, for some other providers, 10 slash 8 will only provide you with 16 million addresses. What happens if you're like Comcast and you have over 16 million users? Then all of a sudden you have duplicate addresses in your own network. So um, what are you going to do? Well, um, some guys at the ITF got smart and they call it uh, dual stack light these days. Um, what if we uh, not only use the IPv4 address of the modem, but we use an IPv6 address? So yes, this involves rolling out IPv6, but only rolling out IPv6 in the edge of your network. The customer doesn't know it. Uh, the way it then works is that uh, on the left you still have the IPv4 connection. Instead of the modem translating that uh, source destination pair as a normal NOT, it would actually stick on an IPv6 header. And uh, on the provider side, there's the carrier-grade NAT, as they call it, so the big NAT box in the provider's network. Uh, who will actually do the translation? The benefit of this is the uh, CPE doesn't need to translate anything. And the great thing for your provider is that since you have IPv6 addresses, uh, those addresses are unique. So you can use that IPv6 address to keep connections apart. And you don't have the problem of duplicate addresses in the customer space. Um, well, I already said this throws in a couple of issues. There are some other work being done, but it's all roughly the same. In the end, you will be sharing addresses with your neighbor. So, well, what are the issues? Um, well, how many users per IP? Because obviously you have a limited set of ports. So, how many users can you supply with one IP address? Well, uh, Alan Durand uh, did some work on ITF74. Uh, he presented some things. And on average, you only have five connections per user, which with 60,000 port numbers would mean that you can easily put 10,000 customers behind one single IP. And you can sell all the other IPs off to your neighbor who wants to pay you good money for those IP4 addresses. But if you're on the like Web 2.0 Ajax site and uh, those interactive sites like maps.google.com, you can easily jam up to like 200 connections. Um, so there's still some things left. Uh, what about redundancy? Uh, obviously, you have that netbox in your network, and it has to be keep working. And if it reboots, it loses all state, all sessions. So all of a sudden, you have 30,000 customers. The web browser, uh, connection reset by peer. Who is peer, and why is he messing with my network? <laughs> Actually, we got that call, maybe once or twice. Um, <laughs> I want to talk to Pear because he keeps resetting my connection. Sorry, uh, Pear is a sort of regular name here in the lowlands. Um, new CP, DS Lite is nice, but for DS Lite you have to support IPv6 and DS Lite as itself as a protocol. So in fact you have to send the customer a new DSL modem or a new cable modem which supports it, costing a hell of a lot of money. Uh, other small thingy, uh, IP as an identity. Of course, it's still, people are getting smart, but there are still websites who actually use your IP to trace you. They place a cookie. If you come back, they know who you are. Unless you're sharing that IP address with your neighbor. And all of a sudden, you can see which items your neighbor clicked on the website. Uh, firewalls. Um, what are you going to do with that? You know? um, in 